Hello, welcome to International Studies on Vernacular Architecture course. In this lecture, we are going to talk about acculturation in architecture. Acculturation occurs when people from different cultures meet each other. Throughout human history, encounters between people of different cultures already happen. As can be seen on the map, people move across continents since 200,000 years ago, from Africa to Middle East, Australia, Europe, Asia, and America. They traveled across the ocean and land for various reasons. One of the first reasons to travel was to find a better place to live. Many migrate from one place to another place, a richer, faraway land with different culture, to live a better life. The other reason were to conquer or to spread religions or beliefs, or to trade, or in search of adventure or fun. One of the most apparent evidence of these past encounters was the ancient trade road known as the Silk Road. The road that linked the Western world with the, with the Middle East and Asia was not a single road, but a network of multiple roads that gradually emerged over the centuries, connecting various settlements and cultures. As shown in the Knowledgeia channel, the story of Silk, Wor Silk Road began when Han Emperor, Emperor Wu, sent an envoy to, envoy to the West to find some aliens in 130 BC. The envoy, called Chang Chen, Witness for the first time a new variety of culture and was particularly interested, interested by the Dayuan people, to be specific by the horses of Dayuan. Emperor Wu then decided to purchase these horses to guard the border and fight with the north. With the success of evading threats from the north, Emperor Wu then decided to take a further step triggering the opening of Silk Road spanning roughly 4,000 miles reaching east to the west. And ex as explained in Encyclopedia Brit Britannica, through a network of trade road carrying goods and ideas, two great civilizations at that time, Rome and China, is connected. Silk went westward and wool, gold and silver went east. Christianity and from Europe and Buddhism from India also spread via the Silk Road. Until today, people still travel from one place to another for leisure, adventure, trade, business, and even for study abroad. The invention of internet opened another level of cultural encounters, exchange of information, knowledge, and technique between different cultures happen faster and more frequently. These various activities make people of diverse background meet. They see, listen, and experience new things from one another. As time goes by, the more they spend time with each other, they borrow, adapt, and modify their way of life. This process has led to changes in the original patterns of life and cultures of the people concerned, as well as the formation of new societies. The meeting of cultures and the resulting changes are what collectively has come to be known as acculturation. So acculturation is a process, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a process of cultural modification of a group of people by adapting to or borrowing traits from another culture. But each culture still able to retain unique cultural markers, either language, food, and or custom. Acculturation for a longer period of time leads to assimilation. Assimilation is when one completely gives up own culture and follows the new one. The fruit bowl and the fruit juice is a metaphor. The fruit bowl for acculturation and the fruit juice for assimilation. In the fruit bowl, we can still see and taste each fruit. But in the fruit juice, all the fruit blends and form a new taste. So assimilation is also known as the melting pot. Now, we are going to see examples of cultural acculturation represented in its architecture. 
in one of the coastal city in North Java called Lhasa. This example is a research that I have done in 2008 together with Yogi Patu Rahim. Lhasem is an old coastal town with a long history. Like most coastal cities, Lhasem community were the first to receive the influence of new ideologies and knowledge that came from various parts of the world. Lhasem originally had a Hindu Javanese Majapahit communities. And at the end of 16th century, it is said that the transition and cultural shift from Hinduism to Islam happened because a member of Admiral Cheng He from China, called Binang Un, sailed to Southeast Asia during the Ming Dynasty. He and his troops stayed in Lhasa to spread the religion of Islam. With the establishment of Al Jami Baitur Rahman Mosque at Lhasa intersection, Lhasa later developed into one of the leading Pesantren networks in the archipelago. Traces of Pesantren can still be seen in several places. One of them is located in the border area between Karangturi district, known as the Chinese settlement in Lhasa, and Kauman district, which is located behind the mosque near the square. On the other hand, the Dutch built a fort in the east adjacent to a Japanese regent's palace, and the Dutch settlement flourished. Around mid-19th century, Chinese refugees from Ngawi and new settlers from China crowded into new settlements of Gedong Mulyo and Babagan district in Lhasem. The government of Regent's Palace and Dutch military headquarters were then transferred to Rembang. Almost at the same time, a sugar factory was founded. This makes the economic area of Lhasem abandoned, while the government area is isolated from the city. Consequently, Lhasem society is free from hierarchy, and because of that, they have more freedom of architecture compared to people in the mountains. Dennis Lombard, author of the well-researched Nusa Jawa Silang Budaya, stated, We can imagine how Lhasem as coastal city flourished into a heterogeneous society consisting of fishermen, sailors, transporters, traders, batik craftsmen, and even adventurers from many parts of the world. A major change happened in 1854 when Dutch East Indies government as colony published a rule that sharpened the concept of foreigner. The Javanese people was labeled as indigenous and professional traders from foreign lands such as Arab, India, or China were labeled as real foreigners. This is the beginning of architectural segregation known by the Lhasa people today as the Javanese, colonial, and Chinese house type. As we can see in the pictures, the difference is apparent just by looking at the roof shape. But according to Christian Norbert Schultz, a Norwegian architect, author, educator, and architectural theorist, the relationship between the house and the landscape is not only established by the overall form and shape of the roof, but it is also visualized by the use of materials and type of construction. So, if we look closer, we can still see the same materials used, brick and wood, but different construction techniques supporting the roof. Brick walls, brick bearing walls in colonial houses, and wooden constructions in Chinese and Javanese houses. The wood construction commonly used in Chinese houses in Lhasem is the Tailiang and Taukung construction. The Tailiang construction is from the vernacular residential structure of northern China, and Taukung is used widely in the Sang dynasty since 12th century. In the Javanese house type in Lhasem, they use Sokoguru, a rectangular wood construction with four main columns by bound by exposed beam at the top. The system holds the main roof construction above. Despite these differences, further observations show similarities in the three types. Are these similarities due to cultural acculturation? If so, what is the blending like? 
and how or in what aspects is acculturation reflected in vernacular architecture. Then why the three different house types still exist? Let's try to understand this architecture through a deeper look at how they use the space. If we compare the typical floor plans of Javanese, Chinese, and colonial house in Lassum, we will find a very basic similarities. A linear circulation in the middle of the building, a front terrace, a back terrace, and an enclosed space function as sleeping room in the middle. This spatial organization and circulation of houses of in Lassum is different from the special organization in the vernacular houses, whether it's in China, Middle Java, or in the Netherlands. The private space for sleeping in houses in Middle Java is at the back, while in, main, in mainland China, the private space surrounds the courtyard. In the Japanese vernacular house, there is a sacred space for rice goddess known as Sentong Tengah. The circulation stops at Sentong Tengah. But in the three house types of Lassum, Sentong Tengah disappears. Most likely, this is due to differences in the livelihood. The livelihood of a community in the mountains are farmers, while the livelihood of Lassum community are fishermen and traders. So, Sentong Tengah as a place for activities to honor rice goddess, Dewi Sri, and a place to store rice no longer needed. Sacred space only occurs in Chinese house types in Lassum, in the form of ancestral altar in the middle of the house. This placement is different from Chinese architecture in mainland China. In China, the ancestral altar is placed in the back of the house. Whereas in Javanese house type and colonial house type, there is no sacred space. This shows an adaptation that may be influenced by the principle of spatial formation which depart from Sokoguru from Javanese vernacular architecture and Jian from Chinese vernacular houses. The principle of forming space based on this Jian is similar to that of Javanese house that starts from the middle where the Sokoguru construction is erected and then expand to front, back, left, and right. The second thing that is interesting to note is the concept of house in Lassum, which is adopted from both Javanese and Chinese ideologies. According to Professor Chahyono, for Javanese people, the basic unit of a house is referred to as Oma, which means the physical form of the house and its spiritual dimension. Oma is thought of as, as a place where one can relax one's mind. The ideal house for Javanese people consists, consists of minimum two main buildings. If possible, includes three buildings. The buildings are an Oma or also called Dalem, a pavilion or Pendopo or also called Pendapa, and the third is the connecting building called Pringitan. Sentong Tengah is located inside Oma or Dalem. In the three house type in Lassam, there is an Oma and an adapted form of Pringitan, but no Pendopo. It is said to be an adaptation of Pringitan because Lassam people call it veranda, terrace, and overhang. The function of Pringitan in Lassam is to accommodate the activities of visiting guests. The concept of house in Lassam also influenced by the Chinese people. The house is more than just construction work, but it is a symbol of family unity and status, as well as a place of refuge. The writing of house, Jia, has a double meaning, namely home and family. The house is structured as a family unit, not individuals. So Chinese vernacular buildings are more oriented inward, clearly visible in the courtyard type. On the outside, it looks more closed, consisting only fences and gates. Here, there, are, there is a clear boundary between public outside and family inside. The relationship between the community and the family is only at the opening 
in the form of a gate. In Lhasa, many houses use gates and fences. This creates a very distinctive environmental character. The boundaries between public and private space are clearly defined in several districts in Lhasa. In the section, a pattern of the same arrangement of space is, is apparent, consisting of five parts. One, front porch. Two, closed space. Three, back terrace. Four, the surface area and backyard. And five, the front yard and the gate. As you can see in the section, building, the building mass is varied. Sometimes the house consists of one building mass, but because of the roofs, sometimes the, the house looks like it consists of up to three buildings. The colonial house type and one Javanese house type only, one, only has one roof, while in the Chinese and another Javanese house type, there are three roofs. Maybe it's because they do not have the knowledge to make a wide span, a wide span structure, or maybe the house is expanded, added because of new needs. They stack structural models, models toward the short side, towards the back and front. The back terrace, surfaces, and backyard also used for producing batik. Lasem batik is famous for its motif, also showing a cultural acculturation. As you can see in the picture, dragon ornament is clearly derived from Chinese culture. Its distinct red, the red color, can only produce using water from Lasem. Their batik is more colorful than those from the inland batik, which are darker. The colorness depict the heterogeneous society of Lhasa. The batik practice has become Lhasa's daily lives. While the ladies are the ones do doing batik, the young men gather together, decorate their cigarettes with batik ornaments using coffee. They named the activities Kopi Lelet. In 2018, when I visited Lhasem 10 years later, Lhasem has become a local tourist destination because of its unique architectural features. However, the ones that is brought up is the Chinese architectural features. The pictures shows a famous homestay called Rumah Merah or Red House, which is a Chinese house type with the same special arrangement and circulations mentioned before in Lhasem. Its neighbor, also a Chinese house type, has turned the house into a, a batik shop. So Lhasem continued to evolve in, according to changes in the situations and context. It can be seen from the explanation, the similarities in spatial organization, circulation, placement of buildings and gates in Lhasem vernacular architecture are a mixture of the concepts of house and the blending of people's activities in their daily lives. We can conclude that the cultural assimilation occurred in Lhasem bring forth a similar pattern of activity of the people. This gradually began to affect its architecture. Meanwhile, the differences that appear visually in the roof shape and construction of the three house type in Lhasem are a, re a representation of the social status depicting their ethnic identities influenced by the Dutch political regulations which divides the identity of indigenous, the Javanese, and foreigner, Chinese, Arabic, India. In analyzing cultural acculturation, it is important to note that we do not try to find origins or see who was influenced by whom, like finding out eggs or chicken spurs, but rather to understand vernacular architecture as a result of cultural encounter process. So we have come to the end of this lecture. Throughout the lecture, we have discussed what is acculturation, how contact between groups and the resulting dissemination of information and technique influence cultural change, how socio-political change can affect acculturation, 
and the example have us sh has also shown the importance of understanding history and context for understanding cultural acculturation in vernacular architecture. To conclude the lecture, here are some terms related to cultural acculturation. Acculturation, when a culture maintains traits but adopts some aspects of another culture, the football. Assimilation, when one or more than one culture experiences entire cultural loss and form a new culture, the fruit juice. Multiculturalism, when one believes in valuing diverse and distinct plurality of culture, and when one believes tolerance of differences, this related to acculturation, the fruit bowl. Cultural appropriation, when a culture takes part of marginalized culture and uses it for their own benefit. Hopefully, the explanation of the term and the example in Lassum provide you a clearer idea of how, why, and what cultural acculturation can be represented in its vernacular architecture. Here are some references of the lectures that you might be interested to look further. Thank you. See you in the next lecture.